Well, the um, paper we'll present today is on the optimal pricing of academic journals in the two-sided model. And in particular, we will um, analyze the effect of copyright in this model and the effect of a removal of copyright, which is, uh, I think, uh, more interesting. Um, let's have a look at the agenda of the presentation. We first uh, talked about the uh, problems at hand, um, then the model, the notation, uh, profits of uh, a monopolistic journal. Um, we will not go into mathematical detail, but provide you with some uh, numerical simulations. And the fifth section, we will analyze um, what the removal of copyright does on the uh, journal market. Now, um, there's recently been a great deal of discomfort with the way in which for-profit journals are run. And since Maharaj, we talked about it, you, um, you complain a little, about, a little bit about all the refereeing you do. Um, and when, when you really think about it, what do the commercial publishers actually do? I mean, the, um, we, or our research, is funded by government, government, uh, governmental money, governmental funding. So we do the research. We, um, we provide the input for the academic journals. So what do the academic journals actually do? I mean, we uh, provide the quality assessment. We do it for free. So what the journals then do is they, they sell it, the, the journals back to us or at our libraries and at high cost. They bundle, they bundle the journals and sell it back to us at high cost. So it seems a little bit absurd. What do uh, um, journals actually do for us? Okay. So um, there has been some uh, arguments going on and um, one way forward uh, it would be to uh, introduce fully online journals uh, under an open access model. And under open access would mean that um, um, author, uh, uh, authors would pay a publication fee, but there would be no subscription fee for readers, so zero uh, reader, reader cost. And I think Chevelle, Stephen Chevelle from uh, Stanford Law School, he, no, Harvard Law School, he puts it to this extreme and he says, well, the best way forward to achieve this goal would be to abolish copyright in academic works at all. So in this case, it would be some kind of um, forced uh, open access. Now, however, uh, McCabe and Snyder, they argue that under this kind of uh, open access of journals, um, this would uh, likely uh, compromise co journal quality. Why is that? Think about it. If um, if journals only generate their profits from the author side of the market, then in this case they might have an incentive to accept uh, lower quality papers uh, as compared to a situation where um, they, they would have um, um, also profits generated from the real side. Now, um, the social life implications, because it's a relatively new strand of literature, they are not at all clear uh, what happens if uh, copyright for academic works uh, were abolished. Neither is clear uh, what would happen to our welfare, academics, so academics as readers and academics as authors. Um, would it be easier or harder to publish? We don't know. What about the average quality of publications? Would it increase or decrease? Oh, we don't know yet. And it's really hard. Um, how do you quantify? You mean the? Um, uh, is it easier or harder to publish? In acceptance rates. Yeah. Right. But so. Okay, but I mean, if there's no constraint, right? Uh, I mean, if, it, if I understand it right, if you have uh, open access, yeah. then basically it's free, right? Because everything is online, right? Marginal cost is zero. Whereas uh, in the other case, where it's just sort of, uh, in a book form, yeah. then in a printed form, yeah. then or, or do you sort of assume the same costs? Of, uh, well, we, in, I mean, it's a, it's a simplified model, of course. What we actually we we uh, analyze a monopolistic journal that only provides the um, research online, so it's it's not a hard print journal. Okay. Okay, so this is, these, are, these are the simplifying assumptions here in the model. Because we will only want to focus on, you know, this two-sided market aspects of, journal, of journals. Um, uh, on the one hand, the reader side, and on the other hand, the author side. We'll come to this. Okay? 
Now, as I said, the model, let's go through the notation here. So the journal, the, the monopolistic journal, um, chooses quality denoted by Q, um, the price charged to readers, to readers which would be the uh, subscrip subscription fee uh, denoted by PR, and the price charged to authors uh, denoted by PA, which is the publication fee. Now, as I said, we have uh, the journal acts in order to maximize profits, and we uh, consider here that the uh, journal operates at a mono at a, uh, as a monopolist. Yeah. Uh, quality is the minimum quality of it, uh, accepted paper. Now, I mean, we, yeah, this is um, well. It's a it's a um, we don't explicitly model the referee process here. But it's just the, the quality has an impact has an uh, has an impact on social welfare. For instance, we um, for instance, if the quality of a journal increases, we assume that then the um, number of readers would increase too. Okay, so higher quality journals would attract more readers. So here, I'm saying quality in any way kind of So it's just like even the the, the ranking list of the journals. Mm -hmm. It's implicitly a quality like, measure. But just what you said is that the quality of the issue isn't then exceeding the issue of the indicator of the quality. We haven't thought of that, haven't we, genetically quite yet, yeah, but yeah. It's like choose magazine, you know, they get millions and millions of readers, but I'm sure the quality is that. I don't really actually know how, how the, you know, the ranking of journals is, but if it was done by numbers of readers, then the two concepts get we're just taking it as a, actually what Frank said, right? It's something that, that we understood or understand has to do with the referee process. But when you send a paper to Econometrica, it's harder, to, the same paper is less likely to be published than if you send it to somewhere else. So why? Because the paper directs that are asking for a higher yeah, it's quality. So, it, so it's not per se the acceptance? No, no, no. It's, it's the quality of Maybe this becomes clear when we, when we go into the details of the model. Okay. Now, um, uh, we already have it here. So given that choice, the quality, um, the reader price and the author price, um, the number of readers is endogenously given by um, the number of readers, uh, and the number of authors is endogenously given by uh, the number of authors here as a function of Q, the, um, the author price, and the number of readers. Now, and both um, um, are determined by the quality chosen. Now, uh, it's important to note that um, the number of readers uh, depends directly on the price charged to readers, and the number of authors also depends directly on the price uh, charged to, to authors. Uh, on the other hand, the dependence of the number of readers on the price charged to authors is indirect, and we will see that uh, in a graph in a couple of minutes, uh, and also the number of readers is partially determined by the number of authors and vice versa. Now here, um, the fact that the two functions, so the, um, the number uh, of readers and the number of authors, that they are interdependent um, with the value of each uh, other, 
this um, suggests the uh, feature of a two-sided uh, market uh, here for academic journals. And we um, can think about these two functions, so the number of readers and the number of authors in two uh, different ways. First, as I've mentioned before, if the reader price uh, increases, um, then the, um, uh, the, number of the, the number of readers increases. So for given values of uh, quality Q and the number of authors, we can, understand, uh, we can understand the number of readers to be a function in the sense that it relates the price uh, for reading to the number of readers. Couldn't a reader judge quality by the price charge? So if you do not charge the price, the price charge. Yeah, that's So we we, have, we haven't explicitly uh, modeled this this feature in here. Uh, it's just uh, uh, that um, um, well, as I said, um, it's a, it's a demand for. In the, in the, you'll see uh, in, the, in the just thinking again, we did right that there's a few graphs here that will show that there are instances in which quality goes up, but the price goes down. So I don't, I mean. And that's unregistered for the maximization. The journal choosing, ultimately, um, we have the opposite in some instances. Okay. So, um, and the other way we can think about this um, this uh, number of readers would be for um, for given values of the quality and the price of readers. We could under, could understand the number of readers to be a production function in the sense that. Um, um, authors, so the number of authors are what attract readers to a journal. Okay, so we have these two features of uh, of the, the number of readers. First, as a demand function, and second, as a production function. Um, and we uh, again, this is the same. This is the same for the uh, author function for the number of authors. It can be understand. Uh, it can be understood as a demand function and also as a production function. And we will. Uh, see, and uh, we will illustrate this um, this feature um, in uh, the next graph. But first, first let, let's look at the assumption that we make. So, the if the if the price if the reader price increases, then the number of readers decreases. The same is, is true for the number of authors. If the number of authors uh, increases, then the number of readers increases. Uh, the same is true for the number of authors, which increases when the number of readers uh, increases, and we have co uh, concave uh, production functions here. So the demand functions are negatively sloped, and the production functions are positively sloped, but weakly concave. Okay? So we also assume that here, um, if the quality increases, then the number of readers increases, and if the quality increases, then the number of authors increases. So we, uh, we will graph this um, in figure one. Now here you have the demand curve aspect of um, the uh, reader side of the market. So if the price, reader price increases, then the number of readers decreases. And on, on the right hand side, we have the production function um, feature. So if the number of authors increases, then this will increase the number of readers, but it's a concave production function. Okay? So but here it's important to know that we only look at the reader side of the market. And the thing here is that um, a reader price or the reader price of PR0 induces a number of readers of NR1. And on the other hand, the number of authors, NA0, uh, induces a number of readers of NR2. So this means that the, this, this reader price and the number of authors, they imply an inconsistent number of readers. So this is due to the fact that we here in this figure, which is obviously wrong, only look at the reader side of the market. So what we actually have to do, or what is important to notice, 
that we have to address this uh, two-sided market feature of the uh, academic journal in order to, um, uh, in order to address uh, this problem. So the choice of reader price cannot be taken independently from the choice uh, of the author price. So this is clear here uh, from figure one. As I said, inconsistent numbers of readers implied by um, this reader price and the number of authors. So what we actually have to do in order to solve this problem, we have to simultaneously include a similar analysis of the author side of the market. And this is what we uh, do here. So again, this is the demand, uh, this is the, the uh, reader demand function, um, this is the reader production function, and what we have here, this is the, the, the author demand side. So if the price, if the author price increases, then the number of authors decreases, and we have the uh, production function, uh, uh, the author, author production function here, um, given by this curve. So the demand, demand function and production function relate to the number of authors uh, and readers. Now, and here, uh, by introducing also the, um, the author side of the market, we can see that there's only one consistent choice, um, which is labeled here as P, uh, P0, given, uh, given by PR0 and PA0. And only with, only with that choice of prices, the, um, the equilibrium author price will be consistent with the equilibrium reader price. Okay? Um, so in order to, uh, to explain this, this graph a little more, what would happen if uh, we increase the reader price and keep the author price constant? So this is what we will do here on, on the next slide. Now, if uh, the reader price increases, we will have, and we, we start here with this uh, equilibrium first, PR0. Then we first have a shift along the reader demand function from here to here. So we have, this is the, this is the starting equilibrium. This is the uh, corresponding point here on the demand function. So we have a shift going down from here to here. Okay. So because yeah, the price the price uh, increases, so the um, um, so the number of readers decreases. So it's a shift along um, the reader demand function. So you get sort of a shift in the demand curve, or you get a movement along. This is a movement along. This is a movement along. Uh, the, the demand curve, but we have different. We have, we have uh, uh, four more effects here, and we'll come to this. So um, the second is that um, um, with this, the reader production function, so NR um, shifts inward. This is the second. This is the second effect. Then um, we have a shift along the author production function. So, um, starting with the um, situation here, we have, a, we have a shift down here. No, 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 on the top, on the top right hand. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I was shift yeah, right yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. So we have the shift here from here to there. Should we call it movement? Let's confuse it. This is movement. It's a, it's, yeah, it, right. It's a, it's a, it's a movement along uh, the author production function. Yeah, that's true. And now, since the uh, the number of uh, readers has this, this decreased, um, this would shift the author demand function, and this is now a shift. This would shift the author demand function inwards. Okay. And fifth, as the number of authors has, has decreased, this would shift the reader demand function inwards. This is the shift here. Okay. So and uh, these shifts continue until a new uh, equilibrium is attained, uh, and this is the equilibrium given by, by this number of readers and this number of authors. So this is the 
the basic structure how, how the market, the two-sided market of journals uh, works here in our, in our model. Now, let's look at the profits. Uh, yeah. Before you do that, I, I was trying to think if this is a, like a, some sort of price space. You know, if I have a little kind of general equilibrium model, I have to, you know, demand and supply for the X and it leads to a price, the supply curve and demand curve, but that's you know, some sort of substitution momentarily between the product line and vice versa, something like that. And so I, I can think of a general equilibrium model, but when I, we talk about inconsistencies, but I still haven't got my head around the idea of sort of a disequilibrium in some market here where there's, a, you know, there's, uh, um, there's an excess demand for this product or, or an excess supply of the product, something like that. Is there, have you kind of got a language like that or is it just inconsistency? I mean, shifts must be implying yeah. something like that. But. So it's not so much a demand and supply world as far as I can tell, right? So the demand and supply from authors, the supply of authors will Depend, right? How many authors there are depends on, on a bunch of other things. So the, the, the idea we were trying to, to, to place here is rather, I think, the, so disequilibrium in terms of um, something that's changing, so it's not, it's not stabilized at a, at a fixed point, kind of thing. Right? So the, uh, the two prices are inconsistent with each other because one, they, 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 they each implies a different value of the other. Yeah, but the inconsistency I'm trying to think of as a, as a, as a, as a disequilibrium in two markets, and then I can think of the adjustment process that would occur. But anyhow, it's, it's okay. I just wanted to keep you know, any insight in that change that I needed the two markets happening, two prices, a general equilibrium, to a framework for, for those different modes. So, so there's, there will be more than one set of, also potentially more than one set of consistent prices. And so potentially. We're embarrassed to just straight up make an assumption. We will certainly um, uh, derive the profit maximizing um, uh, quality and reader price and author price so in a minute. So, but graphically, uh, to come back to the profits, um, well, the profits uh, under the assumption that the journey is fully online and has no marginal cost, and the profit are just you know, price times the reader price times the number of readers and uh, uh, author price times authors, and we can just easily redraw the situation here, so the um, profit generated uh, from the author side of the market is given to it by this shaded area, and the profit generated on the reader side of the market is given by this shaded area, okay? So total, total profit are just uh, well, the two rectangular Now, um, in general, well, the, 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 um, the journal chooses the quality, the reader price, and the author price in order to uh, maximize profit. We just, we'll just go through uh, how we do it here in the model. So um, we hold the quality fixed uh, at some level, and given that, um, the optimal uh, price, uh, pricing policy um, is, uh, is given by, by P star. Um, and given uh, the optimal prices for each quality level, we consider the optimal um, quality that the journal should choose. Now we um, have to simultaneously solve the two equations uh, for the two equilibrium levels of readers, um, and then we plug this in into the, the, the profit, uh, profit function of the journal. So this is pretty standard. Um, however, uh, I will not, we, we do not do it as algebraically uh, here uh, today, but just um, provide you some uh, numerical uh, simulations here. Um, we have three concrete versions of the model. So we have, um, in, all, in all three versions, we have linear, linear reader and author's uh, demand functions. But 
the three models they differ in the concavity or where the, uh, in the concavity of the production functions. So in the first model we have uh, concave readers and authors production functions given here by the square root in the first model. In the second model we have uh, a, con a concave readers uh, production function given here but a linear author production function and in the third model it's just the other way around. So we have the, uh, uh, the diminishing returns uh, here on the number uh, on the number of author function given by the square root. So these um, these differences they uh, lead to uh, it, well interesting interesting results we think. Uh, first of all, um, well we find that in all three models the profit function is concave in both prices. Well, in in model one because it's a symmetrical uh, model of the prices are pretty pretty straightforward. So we have uh, alpha times two divided by three. So it's uh, the same reader price and author price. But for the um, uh, for for model two, where we have the concave reader production function, um, the optimal author price and the optimal uh, reader price they are given by this uh, this uh, graph here. So look at the optimal reader prices given by this, uh, this curve here. Interestingly, so it, um, we have quality on the horizontal and the optimal price and the price on the vertical axis. So with, if the quality increases, then the optimal reader price increases first, but then goes down, and to a level of, uh, to zero, at a quality level of Q0. So what happens here? So the, uh, the re uh, uh, zero, uh, zero reader price um, is, is, situ is an open excess model situation. Okay, so in model two, with concave reader production functions for for uh, a quality of level of Q zero and higher levels, we have uh, open excess. We have that open excess would be optimal for the journal. The author price is given by this line here. So this the, the, the dash, dash lines they correspond to the fact that, well, in theory, here the it would be optimal for the journal to pay readers to read the journal, which is of course impossible. So we have a piecewise function here, so um, that, uh, which takes into consideration that the reader price cannot be cannot be negative. Well, why would it be impossible to do that? You're just ruling that out. Well, you well, can I mean, imagine if I said I'm reading really the journal, so they should pay me, but nobody looks. Right? It's, it's just an ungovernable thing. There is. There is there yeah, some yeah. measure. I'm not sure which journal it is. But they measure how for how long you're logged in. Oh, yeah. But even that's not very Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. you can't tell if someone's reading a PDF. It's, it, but, I mean, if you started paying readers, everyone would log in and they go and have a cup of tea. Just keep prizes for correctly answering multiple choice questions at the end. If you want to do that. Some 
some set of readers. So the greater is the set of readers, if there's some fraction of readers that sign, then perhaps the fact that we're interested in science is simply because we can't measure readers. But you're interested in science because that's what pays off in your CV, right? And that's what people can count. But if people could count readers, I think you better outside. Here of this this little model um, is that is uh, the the high quality journals find it optimal to um, go open access, and this is um, well not not something that we see in reality because uh, most of the open access journals that we have today you can see today they are mostly uh, journals of lower quality. So I mean well this uh, mo this this finding also contradicts uh, the. Uh, McCabe and Snyder paper from 2005, who say that well, open access journals um, are um, journals with lower quality. And this is what we can show here with this little model that, at least in this case, with concave reader production function, that in this case it is um, the high quality uh, journal that will choose open access. Where was the study published? 2005. Yeah, I think so it was. So it's changed a lot in terms of the quality. I don't think yeah, that right? we, yeah, we, yeah, we so publish yeah. very high quality. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's an option that's been offered by some journals that you mean we're working on this. We, we, we really have to work on this a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's we we, um, we that's a different uh, paper, but it's called hybrid op hybrid open access. For instance, I think public choice and also economic uh, economic theory. Uh, all the, the Springer, uh, the, the Springer journals, they um, offer their authors um, the option to pay three thousand, three thousand for open dollars access. for open access. For their yeah. So uh, this is this is uh, this is another paper we want to talk about uh, this month, but not today. Uh, but we can talk about it later on. I mean, we created a massive data set. We had collected all the information from. Uh, from 15 economics journals and have uh, data on 2,500 2, papers, uh, out of which 250 um, are hybrid open access uh, journals or papers. Um, so, well, um, we don't know, know yet what to do with it, but uh, well, the data set is there. <laughs> and let's see, let's see what, what, uh, what we find out. Anyway, um, okay, uh, but. Um, when we look at model three, so with the concave author production function, then we get a complete different picture. So here, um, this is the uh, curve that shows the optimal reader price, and here we will have the low quality journals uh, that choose open access. Okay, so um, here in our model it depends on where um, we have the concave production function. Uh, with, uh, or the, the question which journals go open access depends on the shape of the uh, of the production function. And how do we determine such shape? Well, we don't know yet. I mean, um, but that's a good point. I mean, I wanted to come back to this later, but. Um, but are you assuming that there's a fixed number of papers and this journal is complete? Or is the. No, it's a. It's a, it's a yeah. There's actually more new papers. Well, um, here we, um, in this, uh, in this, uh, this model, we only analyze uh, a monopoly, uh, the journal that acts as a, a monopolist. But this is work in progress. We want to introduce also capacity constraints in order to uh, address the uh, feature of monopolistic competition here on the journal market. This is work in progress, but we'll, we will come to this later. But um, yeah, I mean, I would, well, we would be very interested um, 
because you know our results crucially depend on where we have the concave the concave production function. So what do you think? Where would be where would we have these uh, diminishing returns here uh, if we add one additional reader? Uh, what would be the effect on the number of authors? Um, and here, if we add one additional author, what would be the effect on uh, the number of readers? So the idea here is that um, if we add here an additional reader, we would you know, add another homogeneous uh, good to the production function. Okay? But here, with the number of authors, we thought, okay, maybe it's not really a homogeneous group that we add to the production function, but each author is different, okay? So our first intuition, and this is very preliminary, is that we would we rather in a world like this, where we have the concave production function here with the uh, author or the number of authors. But, I don't know, if you have any comments on this, we are more than happy to, to get them, because we, well, we don't know yet in which reality or which model actually uh, um, illustrates best the reality. We don't know yet. Our point is that it depends on where, uh, which production function we choose, um, it, that it has different uh, uh, implications on optimal, optimal prices and then also on the welfare, overall welfare, we will come to this in a couple of minutes, and also on the welfare of academics. But we don't know yet whether uh, it's more realistic to have the concave concavitivity concave here or there. Or maybe even um, on both sides. It's probably more, if we were thinking as well, this is just obviously an approximation. It's probably more realistic that both concave are one less than the other. So they are models two and three. Uh, one is more concave than the other, and there's a simplifying something less concave. Okay, but well, we have the here we have the the open access journals uh, of local quality here in, in model three. Now the implications for open access uh, we've talked about it. Well, in model one is never a feature because the optimal reader price is always positive, and uh, model two. Uh, it, open access occurs at uh, high rather than low quality. In three, it's the, the opposite. It's uh, open access occurs at low rather than high quality. But what is also interesting for us is how um, the um, how authors are treated in the, over the three models. So um, they are always charged in model one. We have a positive author price. They are paid in model two for very low quality and they are paid in model three for high quality. Okay. Pardon? You like model two, yeah. I would like them right too. Well, if you're prepared to have your name and they do it, that's probably why they compensate the CV. By the way, do you have any example of journals paying uh, paying yeah. the authors? I I I know so. Yeah? Okay. Not a negative. Yeah, yeah. Well, so sure. you can pay 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 the can pay you 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 Okay. Now, comparative analysis. Um, well, in all three models, the journal's profit um, and social welfare is strictly increased, increasing in convex in quality. So, in this sense, the incentives of the journal and also the incentives of society, society aligned both prefer high quality. And this is where um, our work in progress with respect to the capacity constraints kicks in, but we will come back to this later. Okay, so the capacity constraint will result that there's some sort of, there's some level of quality where the capacity constraints either on the author side or on the reader side binds. Oh, okay, um, 
What is also interesting for us is how you know social welfare is distributed uh, between the journal and academics. Okay, so we have the uh, overall welfare. Uh, we define overall welfare as the surplus of the readers, surplus of the authors, and journal profits. And academics are readers and authors. Now in model one, we have a complete symmetric situation. Um, the surplus is shared exactly equally at all levels of quality, but in model two and three, um, we get more interesting results here, uh, illustrated by another figure. And there are also seven more figures, only seven more figures to come. Um, so we have for um, the model two with concave reproduction function, the share of academic welfare and total welfare increases uh, first if the quality increases. And then here, this is the, the point where uh, open access kicks in. So this is not feasible because this would correspond to a situation where um, the journal would pay the readers. And from this point on, so we have to get a piecewise function, that from this point on, the, um, the share of academic welfare in total welfare decreases uh, in the journal quality. We have a different, different result in model three. Um, it, for a high quality, the share of academic welfare and total welfare uh, increases. Now, um, we haven't talked about copyright or the removal of copyright that are suggested uh, in, the, in the introduction so far, and this is what we will uh, do now. Um, first, Let's think, or um, uh, let's think that the situation, the model that we've analyzed before, uh, that this corresponds to a situation in which copyright protection is in place. So the uh, the journal can act as a monopolist, um, um, and what we do now is, if there is no copyright, so if we abolish copyright as suggested by Stephen Chauvel, then um, the journal would be open to other publishers and would also be open to the competition from uh, well from our own website. We could put our um, our papers on our own websites, SSN, and, and so on. Now, um, now if so, what, what happens if copyright is is abolished? In this case, we would have some kind of um, uh, some kind of um, forced uh, open access. So if copyright is abolished, then the journal has to set a reader price uh, of zero and would then only generate profit from the author side. And this, um, well, this simplifies um, our model. But first note that mm, this is an example of an open access journal. Very high quality. Very high quality. Um, <laughs> It's very high quality and uh, review of economic research and copyright issues. And the interesting thing here is that the copyright remains with authors. Okay, so um, well, it still exists. The journal still exists, so it suggests that well, at least this editor does need copyright in order to go on with his uh, with his work. Um, just yeah, this is just an example for this. So what actually happens when um, when we have uh, 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 forced open access or the abolishment of copyright? Um, now, as I've already mentioned, the journal can only generate profit from uh, from the author side, um, and will be constrained to a, a reader price of zero. But this would uh, again would also be uh, a good feature for uh, for the author, authors because at a price of zero you would have uh, maximum readership. Now, what does it do to our models? Um, the optimum author price turns without copyright turn up, turns out to be uh, this here, and three times up the times two divided by seven, um, and in model two and three the new optimal author price would turn out like this. So uh, would be the same in the two models. 
um, comparing these optimal author prices with the author prices under a regime with copyright, they are unambiguously greater than the price under copyright and they are never negative. So and this, is, this is straightforward. I mean, if the uh, journal cannot generate any profit from the, uh, from the, um, from the reader side, then it would not pay uh, authors because it would then generate negative profit. Now, in all three models, the removal of copyright decreases profits of the journal. Pretty straightforward. Um, it increases the surplus of the readers, also straightforward. But uh, the effect on uh, authors is ambiguous. And while the overall effects of a removal of copyright um, depend on whether well, this effect is positive, or if it's negative, whether it more than outweighs the sum of the um, other positive effects. Now, we can see this here, or this uh, figure summarizes the effects or the, uh, the effect of a removal of copyright measured in relative change. We have a symmetrical situation in model one. For all quality levels, it's uh, a profit reduction of 31%. Welfare increases by 15, uh, around 15%. Um, the, as I've already mentioned, the relative change is, uh, is negative in both cases. Um, however, uh, the uh, effect of a removal of copyright on uh, overall welfare um, is here in Model 2, negative only for very low levels of quality, and then is positive or uh, zero for uh, a, lot, uh, a huge range of quality levels. And here in model three, um, the relative change of um, if the effect of uh, the, the, uh, the relative change um, on uh, welfare under removal of copyright is uh, negative and most and most quality levels and only positive on a very small range of intermediate. Now, um, well, let's look at the absolute change in profit. It's um, relatively tiny when we look here at this figure. It's always negative, as I've, as I've mentioned before. But in model two, in model three, um, this effect, this absolute change in profit, uh, might be significant. So for for high quality levels, um, it reduces, um, it has a significant negative effect on the um, uh, profit, of the, uh, profit of, the, of the journal. So um, here we make the point that uh, as compared to, the, to model three, it, that for high qualities, the, the probability that the, uh, that the journal would close down uh, is higher here in a situation under the model uh, three conditions. Now, absolute change in social welfare. In model two, we have a, um, a positive, uh, absolute, po positive effect on social welfare from a removal of copyright for almost all uh, quality levels. But for um, model three, we have um, mostly uh, negative absolute change uh, in social welfare from a removal of copyright in model three. Now, um, what about the effect of the removal of copyright on the number of readers and authors? Um, well, again, the numbers of readers and authors are always increasing functions of quality. But so it might be that the removal of, of copyright might decrease the numbers of academic serfs. And this is um, summarized by this table here. So in model one, um, the removal of copyright increases the number of readers, and it also increases the number of authors. The same is true for model two. But in model three, um, the uh, removal of copyright increases the number of readers for low quality, but decreases the number of readers for high quality. And it decreases 
the change in losses. And this, um, this difference, the different effects on, on the question whether the numbers increase or decrease, they are, they are important to us if we consider the, consider the capacity, capacity constraints. I mean, the capacity constraints are still work in progress, but we will come to this later. But just keep in mind that on the different models, we have different effects on the reader, number of readers and the number of authors. Okay, so, um, as I've already mentioned, work in progress uh, capacity constraint. So we have, um, uh, it would be optimal for the uh, for the journal to increase quality, okay? So we haven't talked about capacity, or haven't introduced capacity constraint here. But uh, in reality, we would um, uh, find the quality of a journal um, where capacity constraints binds either on the author side uh, or um, on, uh, on, the, whether, on the number of readers available, okay? So then, keeping this in mind, if the removal of copyright increases the number of uh, readers and authors at each quality level, then in this case, the um, capacity constraint uh, would bind at a lower level of quality. Okay? So, um, and if we, so if we introduce um, the capacity constraint, we could have um, countervailing effects of a removal of copyright. Okay, so to be pre to be precise, um, the removal of copyright should uh, lower the journal um, the journal quality in models one and two, because in models one and two, the removal of copyright increases the number of authors and increases the number of readers, okay? So here, the capacity constraint would kick in at um, lower quality levels. So, whereas the removal of copyright in our model without capacity constraint has positive wealthy effects, we have here, an, uh, due to the capacity constraint, have, a, have an effect, uh, a quality reducing effect that might have a negative effect, a countervailing negative effect on um, on welfare. And then, on the other hand, because uh, having in mind that uh, the removal of copyright decreases the number of authors and decreases the number of readers in Model 3, um, then uh, in this case, the capacity constraint would bind at a higher level. So, whereas we have in our model without capacity constraint, strict negative effect of a removal of copyright on uh, uh, total welfare, if we introduce the capacity constraint, then we could, would have a, a positive effect going in the op opposite direction. And then we don't know yet which are the net, uh, the net uh, effects uh, of a removal of copyright on on total welfare, um, and well, it's work in progress, but this is the, the intuition behind this uh, capacity constraint. Now to wrap up, um, well, our conclusions are based on uh, uh, particular functional forms and should be read with uh, due care, of course, um, but I think the, the interesting aspect, and this is where our paper contradicts uh, McCabe and uh, Snyder is that it's not true that only the low quality journals um, go open access. Indeed, we find that uh, conditions, or so the conditions of Model 2, under which um, a profit, profit maximization uh, leads to higher quality journals that choose the open access format. Now, we've all also talked about the effect of removal of copyright. Um, we find that in uh, Model 1 and Model 2, uh, removal of copyright would likely increase social welfare. 
and it could be a different result if we introduce capacity constraints. But it is uh, also possible, and this goes back to your question, where which production function is actually the more realistic one. Um, but we could also have um, a negative effect on social welfare from removal of copyright. And this is under the conditions of Model 3. Okay, this is, this is again uh, um, the capacity constraint feature. Um, so in, in the models in which uh, the removal of copyright appears to increase social welfare, so models two and three, there might be, after the introduction of a capacity constraint, be, huh? One, two, three. Yeah, one, two. What did, did I say two and three? All right, good. Yeah, well, I should, uh, you should uh, know what the difference between one, two, three, that's true. So uh, um, there will be the, the second countervailing effect um, um, of this introduction of capacity constraint. So the introduction of capacity constraint might uh, lead to a re reduction of the quality of the journal and thus to a negative effect on uh, lo uh, total welfare. And then it depends which, uh, which um, um, effect dominates the other. The effect might perhaps eliminate the welfare gains from the removal of copyright under models one and two, but in model three with capacity constraints, um, um, in which the removal of copyright would decrease uh, total welfare. In this case, the introduction of capacity constraints might uh, uh, induce a positive effect uh, on global welfare because. Uh, the capacity constraint would kick in only at a higher journal quality. And this might then reduce uh, and perhaps eliminate the welfare losses from the removal of copyright. So this is uh, uh, work in progress. Yeah, we have to take a closer look at the, these countervailing wealthy effects of the capacity constraint. Oh, that's it. So we could decide for one model over the years, and this is probably not going to help you. But could you, in line with what James was saying, could you somehow take into account the fact that many of the readers are not actually they don't do it for consumption; they do it for investment because they want to become authors themselves, and they want to cite uh, our authors from the same journal. And so, if quality in your model is totally independent of the number of authors, then if I see a high quality journal, I want to get my submission in. Probably uh, the number of authors still increases the chances that I'm going to find an article which is somewhat related, but um, I guess there is a complicated relationship there. Okay. Um, well, we haven't thought, thought about it yet, but it's, uh, we've, we've already thought about that. of as you said homogeneity of the input. So if you're an um, an author and you're interested in lots of readers, and one reader is the same as the next one. And so additional readers that sounds like a very standard model where you're adding a continuous input mm -hmm. and you expect decreasing returns. So that's model three. Model two, on the other hand, says you're a reader and then the journal gets fatter. You get depreciation returns out of that. Well, as, in so much as you've got a fixed amount of time to read, perhaps, but in essence, you're also handing in different, like you're saying, like different products. So you might be searching for an idea, and the, and the probability that that idea is, is there is, is different for each one of the papers. And so you're adding different products to the basket. And so we thought that's more likely to not have so much. Because then you've got that time constraint. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of related. I wonder, I mean, I'm thinking that because probably some low quality journals are open access, some high quality journals are open access. So maybe what that suggests that there's um, 
that there's yes, the multiple, I mean, there's there's different production for, like shapes for different journals. And so maybe there's like the PSC journals versus the general journals. Maybe there's papers that, you know, coming up to yours and I'm Because it's all IO and I'm interested in all of it. But then it's different from if it's general general interest and, and actually it has to be quite big before they start getting IO topics in there and I get interested. I mean, so, yeah. I mean, we look here at, um, well, commercial profit maximizing uh, journals, but we could they could also have different objectives. I mean, to increase readership, this could be, for instance, a more more uh, more important um, objective for a journal. For instance, for for a, for a journal run by by a university. So I mean, we, we we look here at commercial commercial publishers, but this w would certainly be an extension for for the for the model uh, to to look to to. Um, Consider uh, non-commercial publishers. We also thought, well, I mean, Frank doesn't have time to say it too much yet, but in, a, in an earlier version, we had a section in the paper on impact factors because, and then Shanks was interested in that a lot too. So, um, because the removal of copyright, uh, or, or and even the even with copyright, the pricing and quality choices induces a number of The, the ratio of one to the other is what we take as being our impact factor. So it's not science because we have another theory of how reads turn into science or even if they don't, even if it's non reads it turns into science. But if we take in our model the impact factor for the number of readers per paper, right, uh, then we get some really strange results in here about removal of copyright, how it might increase or decrease the impact factor. And also, if the impact factor were to be the objective, um, as it might be, and we see a lot of journals, I think probably that try and twist the impact factor and measure the story around it to get a high impact Then the question is whether, what, what kind of market is the journal market? Is it uh, a competitive market or is it a market of uh, monopolistic competition? For example, if I want to start a new journal, what do I want? Yeah, well, the, the main strength of, so any new journal that starts up, starts up already with a, a bit of weight behind it. So a group of friends who think that this area, this top area hasn't been properly treated or there's some void in the literature in the journal that exists. So they already have a, number, a certain number of submissions because you can't do that. That's the only thing that you really need is the number of submissions. You don't actually need to read the submissions. Right? So you need a number of submissions to, to count with the journal. Um, so as Seamus said, right, I can choose to run, you know, this that famous journal that all seen, I suppose, the Journal of, uh, what is it, the Irreducible Truth? No, there's one well, that's, that's such high quality that they don't protect your publishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so they have such a strict referee process that it doesn't matter what you send in, they'll reject it. So that's called the Journal of Universal Rejection. <laughs> so you can set your, so it, it, it backs down to an assumption that we have here, right? 
in order that our model, this model works reasonably, we assume that the, the number of authors is increasing in the quality. So as the quality goes up, so if you think of a higher and higher quality journal, more and more authors will, will get published there. And this is a dubious assumption, right? Because the higher is your quality, sure, we all want to submit there, but then it's damn hard to get accepted there, right? So the, it enables the number of published papers. So it's not clear that that would always be the case when, when quality is set so high, even though you get everyone submitted, nobody gets accepted. It would likely rather be a, a concave looking function, right? Yeah. And that makes it very hard for us, that, that aspect of it would make it very difficult for us to improve. And what we've looked at is choose a high quality journal of your choice, the American Economic Review. They have no problem filling it in and overfilling it, right? And retaining the concept that it's a high quality journal. Big fat thing with 30 pages in its time, right? Whereas it's the lower quality and that struggles because of not being able to attract the audience. So that, that's the basis for us thinking that we're on the upward sloping path of quality attracting uh, authors. But if you Remove that and you allow quality to decrease the number of authors because the referee process is now monitored to get by. Then, you know, the, the optimality, you don't need a capacity constraint or anything, but the whole thing will, will endogenously turn out right, but you'll get, I think, perhaps quite perverse looking results. I haven't even checked if it will even, but we, we didn't like it. It was so horribly difficult. When quality starts to decrease the number of authors. And we can, and we don't see that in the real world that we look at. The high quality journals are the easiest to see in our form. Did your model take into account another aspect of quality that the journal is selling when they charge high prices? They're doing the sifting process. So like I may be prepared to um, take your money to limited number of hours to spend in my computer and I'll pay for the service if they've done something else and I've got to know the editors I know that they are they uh, they for the papers that they carry on. But it did it should not have taken into account. It it doesn't lead it because we've assumed readers is increasing in quality. So the high quality journal that you're saying the American Book Review has more readers and you can explain that that kind of process that you think of. If they were to charge a higher price, it's still paid for it. No. It's the price is prices and dodges. Yeah. Because yeah. they're yeah. providing another service. Yeah, so we, we, don't, we don't model explicitly um, you know, the, the utility of being a reader down to this detail of, of whether or not you know, like how I value the information given to me, how I value the, uh, the, the process, that, you know, the, the trust that I place in a high quality journal that there's only high quality papers or one one or anything like that. We've reduced it all down to an assumption. The higher is the quality, the more readers will grow. Can you show me the slide that has at least one of the three models, the two equations that define the three models? This is something like that. If you take, if you take, if, if you look at those two equations and you think they're modeling, and you, you substitute Q for N, then the top equation is telling me uh, I want to want to think of it as, as I want to think of it as the manpower because I want to think in price space rather than employment space. So just it's just a modeling thing, and and because I'm a little more familiar with genetic equilibrium ideas uh, and disequilibrium in those markets, I'm thinking in price space. Then. But that top equation, if you look at it, what it's saying is that there's a complementarity, and what the one as well, between uh, the market for R and the market for A. The more A stuff there is around, the farther out is that demand curve for, for uh, the R market, and vice versa. Right? So it's just two equations which are describing two demand curves. Now, if I, I, I want to put in supply, I guess initially I was saying general equilibrium, but I don't need a supply curve, all I need is a monopolist in each market. Then sets a price. 
and there will be, my recollection of this little model at uh, Quirkes is it's a, it's a, it's a multi-market thing in, in price space. You've got complementary goods, you've got price of good one on this axis, price of good two, and if the two markets are independent, then there's some mutual and consistent uh, equilibrium price. And then as the degree of complementarity increases, the, uh, the slopes of these, um, like there's, e there's an equilibrium price in the top equation for every level of n sub a, which is associated with these. And then and, and in one equation, there's an equilibrium price in that market for every level of, of uh, n sub r, which is associated with these bar. And you find mutually consistent ones, but it's in price space. And what happens there is that the degree of complementarity is what affects the sort of uh, how much these prices at any social point shift as various exogenous factors uh, shift. So it's a multi-market equilibrium thing, but instead of competitive markets, you've got monopolistic stuff in each case. So that was, that was one thing. It's just thinking about in price space, what's going on. And the other thing I thought about the shape of these things is um, bringing in the public good aspect of the readership. So uh, so you've got this, this journal, you know, that's really a public good. It's a discrete public good. And you've got a bunch of people who are buying one or zero. And that, but on the production side, you've got these, uh, well, that's how I was trying to think of it. Like, it's sort of, it's a private provision of, uh, it's an exclusive of public good, I think. Uh, at least it's exclusive of public good. But, uh, you might, I don't know, but then, um, aren't there some theories about the, the understanding of concavity of production functions of public goods? It's, it, it's, it's looking at the production process for a public good, and then uh, how do you how do you model um, your private inputs? Do you have a constant resistance scale, weak resistance scale, decreasing resistance scale? Um, I should try to get my brain there because I, I I've seen that somewhere in my education in the past. Is that well, that's what I'm thinking that, that Richard had some stuff about that. that was a well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, all I remember is the topic, but the thought, what I thought is what's missing here is the public good aspect on the leadership side. And in, in, in production of a public good, there might be some things there that help in this, which might be but, but I do think those two equations by themselves are something you can give a student and ask them to solve for the improvement in the models of the prices of those two models. And, and, and also, you notice that both of them have a, a common cube. I mean, which is, it's, it's like, you know, put a zero price. It's just it's the intercept. Right? Yeah. So, but maybe maybe if you kind of you know maybe it's a perception of quality from the reader side and perception of quality from the author side and, and uh, that gives you a better way of just being more flexible in the moment. But it looked at it from the price space. Thing. Well, the the main thing that we we had in an earlier version that helped us at the same yeah. and, and that was because when we made the alphas different, we just shifted the curves up or down or around and nothing. And, and we also thought, well, when, when quality goes up, so think think this up, when quality goes up, as a reader, you know, what is the marginal effect on a readership? Is it likely any different than when quality goes up, the marginal effect for increasing authors? That's intercept. That's all I'm thinking. It's, yeah. it's, it's just, it, it, so it's, it's is there any reason to assume they were different? And we couldn't really come to any real reason, so we left them the same. Yeah, but what I'm thinking is that those two equations, just forgetting about anything else we talked about, that's just a nice little uh, or multi market equilibrium model. But then the way that you would, at least in the way in the court, supposedly world, you would deal with this, you'd say, well, if there was a monopoly in one market and there was competition in the other market, uh, or vice versa, and here you've got two monopolies, you shift the ratio market into a competitive market, and I think you get yourself on the local side of the chief. Because the copyright here is just monkey. Yeah. Right. And so you're, you're, you're changing the market structure. And in that, I don't know if I'm talking at too much attention, but it's really this looking at it in price space is a multi market equilibrium. Well, the graphs that we do, you have a price quadrant. I don't know if you saw that. Oh, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we didn't carry it through, drawing dots in there and drawing a line through. Yeah. We, those two equations would, would allow me to come up with a uh, uh, defined term for the 
Um, I think it's so. So that's why economics. Uh, so recently, I was trying to sign up camp. Uh, they don't post very good for business. It's a cloud. I don't know. And I've had. I've had. Uh, we actually. It's pretty. Why don't we do it? I've had. <laughs> it, 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 it's true. Here's, an, here's another example. The, the on, on, on our searching website, right? We're having. We publish, we put in the working papers, that is the papers that come to the conference, so there's a link and you can just download all these conference papers. And I've had several people tell me their papers have been published elsewhere, and the publisher makes them remove yeah, this link, right. and I have to remove the link. This is, this is including the, the copyright agreement that you, uh, that you have to sign. Yeah. Yeah. Even earlier versions of yeah. the Yeah, 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 you have. Yeah, earlier yeah. versions. Yeah. It's probably not legal, but you could probably say this stuff. I mean, they, they can say, well, I won't The question is whether they enforce it, yeah. but they could. I mean, they could They could make you uh, take all uh, pre uh, previous versions from from SSRN and uh, Red Pack and uh, other other platforms. So this is what, I think this is what you sign when you sign the, co the copyright transfer agreement. Nevertheless, your comment is, uh, I, I heard David McKnight say the same thing. Who the hell reads journals? 
we, 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 he must read so many papers that he doesn't need. So he reads everything. It gets into him just being a referee, but he reads everything he needs in the working papers. Which is Game yeah. with the uh, incumbent the and entrenched. Yeah. So uh, and one one and that's uh, precisely what you, uh, you need something. I mean, journal that you don't want any monopolist there, and then you get something across. One other journal entering the market, mm -hmm. 
So what would be the strategic you know, variables to you know, co compete with the, with the external AMI boxes? Or and, uh, I mean, that, oh, I, 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 yeah. from my oh, this, oh, this shit, this thing, yeah, okay, so I got this thing, thing, and then I go over the town. Where is it, K, where is it, K? Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, what does it, how does it influence oh, okay. domestic so, uh, and uh, I, mean, I, I know it's somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Overall, then. Okay. Uh, consult. Do you know where we're supposed to do the KGO2 or something? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, KJO2? KG, I think. KG, I think yeah. it is G. Yeah. KG. Oh, I think that, I mean, the, the whole uh, competition story of the journal market is, uh, we haven't addressed it so far because we. You first want well, yeah, to go on, all, you know, only have a very simple model uh, in order to, you know, to, to uh, get, get an idea of what's going on in the journal on this two-sided market for journals. This is what we, this was for our, this was what our first objective. But now, of course, we have to, you know, address kinds of, you know, monopolistic competition. This is what we uh, tried by the introduction of the. Capacity consent, probably capacity, yes. Uh, so we process. partially addressed this already, but of course, I mean, what happens if we will, if we have uh, one other journal huh, entering the market? What happens then? But my intuition is that it would then still, uh, the results would still depend on which which model we have to look yeah, at. And even within the same framework, I guess if if you have n number of journals, even without free entry, if we have say exit in some sense, exit meaning if some journal goes from that copyrighted that